I won't. Um, I'm Alexis Bardzinski. I'm the veterinarian at Austin Pets Alive. Um, this is Katie Kresick. She's the Parvo manager. Um, and we're just going to go over Parvo um, and give you a bunch of information about that. Um, to, so to start off, um, we just want to go over, we have a very high um, success rate with Parvo. Um, so I think our treatment protocols are very good. Um, currently this year, we have an 86% um, save rate. Um, and this was all started in Dr. Jefferson's bathroom. And we'll kind of go over this and how you can start, start up yourself um, with fosters in their bathrooms. It's, it's pretty easy. Um, we'll tell you how to start saving, you know, right now, what you can do, even with the least amount of, um, you know, uh, things and fosters and medications and that kind of um, thing here, and how to expand your program to have an actual ward, you know, in the future, um, as well as go over some medical complications that might occur during this process. And basically, parvo is a viral a disease. It's a virus. It's everywhere, essentially. Um, it's transmitted via feces and just oral secretions, vomit, that kind of thing. Um, so you have to just expect it to be everywhere outside. That's why vaccines are so important in these naive little puppies um, that can't fight it off without vaccines. It's very hardy out in the environment. Um, so if it's, if, you know, a parvo puppy defecates somewhere, you want to block it off, you want to bleach it, you want to leave it. If it's out in the sun, leave it for a few months. <laughs> Don't let any other pu pu puppies go in that area. Um, or if you're, if you're inside, obviously, bleach it, let the bleach sit overnight, um, that kind of thing. Uh, we normally see them get infected about one to five days after they're exposed to the virus. It just depends on the animal. Um, or they may never um, get infected by it. It just depends on their immune system. And if they're vaccinated, there's a much decreased rate that they'll ever get it. Um, and the symptoms usually last for five to 10 days. That's an average. Uh, it could be sometimes a little longer. And, um, but basically, at least five days, they're going to be showing signs. Um, and it attacks the gastrointestinal tract. So they're going to have vomit, diarrhea. The first signs you see are probably going to be in appetence. They're going to just not be eating as well, a little bit more quiet than usual for a puppy. And then they'll start vomiting and having diarrhea. And they'll have severe bloody diarrhea um, a lot of times. And so the causes of death are going to be by dehydration um, or the the smaller, tiny puppies will get hypoglycemic just from not getting in the food and vomiting. Um, and then just really severe infection, sepsis, uh, that can go through the body. So that's why these antibiotics are very important. So preventing vaccinating is the number one. You know, when a puppy comes in to your shelter, vaccinate right off the bat. Um, and if they suspect signs of parvo, um, you want to isolate them. There's an easy test, it's the ELISA test. You know, it takes eight minutes, take a fecal sample. Um, you'll have your results right then. Sometimes they don't come up positive initially. Um, it might take 24 to 48 hours. So you wanna really evaluate them, look at the signs. If they're just vomiting um, and they're otherwise bright, not having diarrhea, you might not test them. That might just be parasites or something, but they have multiple signs um, and they're lethargic, you wanna test them for sure. Um, and then the other thing is that you want to decontaminate after them. If you suspect a parvo puppy, um, definitely, like I said, bleach overnight. Make sure it's disinfected because um, it can survive pretty, pretty well. So to start out treating um, without fancy medical supplies is possible. You basically need, um, you need a foster with a bathroom. You need a few medical supplies. You need like two antibiotics, some fluids, and an antiemetic. Um, so that's three medications, some fluids, uh, some needles, some fluid lines. You need, um, you need to be working with a veterinarian, whether that's the veterinarian from your shelter, a local veterinarian who's agreed to help you out. Um, you're going to need a veterinarian to buy supplies and to make assessments of the dogs. Um, we say assessments, it's not realistic for them to necessarily come over to your house every day, but you're going to be communicating with them and they probably want to come over and see the dogs um, occasionally. We'll go over all this later on too. Um, and for, so if you're uh, saving dogs through parvo fosters, those fosters need to be treating only parvo dogs and the only dogs that are ever in their house are parvo dogs. 
um, because it is contagious and dangerous to uh, any unvaccinated dogs. Those fosters would be doing treatments twice a day in the morning and the evening. That They would take about an hour. Um, you could consider having multiple fosters for dogs in different stages of the disease. Maybe one foster who would treat dogs that are you know, very sick, um, actually vomiting, need a lot of medication, and um, a different foster for dogs that are you know, on the road to recovery who would be doing more oral medications and supportive treatment until you know, they're happy and healthy and eating and having solid poops again. Um, this foster wouldn't have to have any medical experience. A lot of the volunteers who um, were, uh, volunteer in the Parvo Ward right now come to us with no medical experience at all. It's, um, they just need a little hands-on training for how to give sub-Q medications. It's something that you can teach in about 10 minutes. It's really easy. Um, you give them an instruction manual that answers a lot of um, common questions and explains what they're doing and has you know written out procedures for them to follow and then an on-call phone number so that if um, something changes or they have a problem they can get in contact with the veterinarian or someone else who knows what to do about it. So with Parvo, decontamination protocols are really important because as you're treating Parvo, even if you don't save those dogs, what you really want to do is make sure it doesn't spread to anyone else, any other dogs anywhere in your shelter. Um, so the first thing is dogs with Parvo have to be isolated. Um, like I said, no, no um, other unvaccinated dogs in the house of a parvo foster. Or if you have an ICU, um, nobody comes into the ICU but dogs with parvo and people who are trained um, on how to scrub in and out who are going to take care of them. Um, we, you want dedicated scrubs and shoes. Parvo is spread through feces and anything that can get feces on it, which is everything. And puppies get feces everywhere because they're like terribly gross, <laughs> um, especially when they have and Parvo. Cute. Very cute. cute. We love them, but they get poop everywhere. Um, so you want dedicated scrubs and dedicated shoes uh, so that um, all, you can take them off when you're done treating and leave leave them in there so that you don't have um, parvo on your shoes or your scrubs. And um, dedicated shoes works better than like stepping in a foot bath because you would really have to stand in that foot bath for about 10 minutes before your disinfectant was effective. Um, you need a toilet because since parvo is spread through feces, you don't want to be like just putting that parvo feces in your trash. Also, parvo feces is really, really gross. Um, <laughs> so you, we pick it up with toilet paper and we flush it. Um, we also flush food. This is because if you have like a big dumpster like we do, um, if you have bags with food and tra food and poop sitting in there, raccoons kind of like that kind of thing, and then they get into the trash and they get into the parvo, and they spread parvo everywhere they walk. Um, you want a place where you can wash your hands properly, so a sink with soap and water. Um, will, uh, and you need a washer and dryer because Parvo creates a lot of laundry. Um, ideally, you would have a separate washer and dryer if you're like in a shelter setting, um, or if you're a foster, you would have you would wash all the Parvo stuff separately and you wash it in bleach. Um, you also need a tub because once the Parvo the dogs are healthy again, um, they've still got all this Parvo all over them, so they need to be bathed very thoroughly before they they can go anywhere else. Um, these are our scrubbing in and out procedures that we follow every time anybody enters or leaves the Parvo ward. Um, they're very strict, they're written out, they're displayed in our area um, so that nobody makes a mistake. So when you go into the Parvo ward, there's a clean side and a dirty side, and in the middle is a line. So on the clean side is where you take off your street clothes, um, you can keep your bra and underwear on, but you need to take off your shoes, your shirt, your socks, your, uh, your pants. Step over onto the dirty side and you step directly into Parvo shoes. You never put your feet on the floor on the contaminated side because then you have Parvo on your feet. Um, you step into the Parvo shoes, you put on your scrubs, and you don't come out again without doing the decontamination protocol to come out. So when you come out, you kind of do everything in reverse. The first thing you do is you wash your hands. Um, you wash your hands really well and you wash it up to where your scrubs come because you've probably been picking up those puppies so it's not just your hands, it's your whole arms that have Parvo on it. So you scrub up to the top of your shirt uh, or at the top of your their sleeve. Um, then you from there you go directly into the changing area. You take off your your parvo scrubs. You take off your parvo shoes. And without stepping on the floor, you step back onto the clean side, so your feet only ever touch the clean side. Um, you immediately wash your hands. You got parvo on your hands again when you touched your scrubs. Um, so you wash your hands before you put your clothes back on. Um, and then you leave. You could, um, sometimes we used to have a foot bath that you could also step into just as sort of an extra step. It's not um, necessary, but. Yeah, foot bath studies have shown that you either have to have really clean foot baths because the particles in that foot bath are going to um, prevent the disinfection process. So it has to be a clean, super clean foot bath, um, which is hard to do when you have so many people going in and out. Um, and so it's really not effective. And like she said, you have to stand in it for a certain amount of time. And so we just play it safe. 
And plus, it's easier not to have a foot bath, essentially. Um, so proper hand washing, this is kind of basic. Once again, you wash all the way up to your scrubs, and you want to make sure you wash for 30 seconds. You get the, um, you know, between your fingers and under your fingernails, because Parvo gets everywhere. Um, did you want to take this? Sure. So this is an example of our treatment sheet. We have treatment sheets. That way, all we have to do is fill out how much of each medication is given. And so uh, a veterinarian like myself would go in there once a day, look over all the animals, examine them, and then write out the treatments with boxes so that the volunteers know exactly what to give. So they're not making really the choices I am. They just go in and say, OK, it needs Batril, Polyflex, Reglin, you know, and LRS, and they give it. Um, so, and everything is documented. I'll go down in the notes section way at the bottom. Um, I'll just write, you know, basic physical exam findings, like they're bright, they're quiet, their gums are pink, that kind of thing, and if I'm going to change any um, treatments up so that the volunteers know. Um, and all this stuff can be downloaded down there at that website so you guys can have it. Um, so the medical supplies, we do a broad spectrum antibiotic mix uh, just to make sure we're hitting everything. And so Polyflex, which is uh, ampicillin, uh, we can give that under the skin. It's really easy. It does sting a little bit, so you want to give it with a little bit of fluids. Um, and then Batril. Now, Batril is a heavy-duty antibiotic, um, and a lot of people cringe uh, and say, why are you using such a you know, heavy-duty antibiotic that it could cause secondary side effects? But the thing is, is that we see such a high success rate with it, and these puppies, it's life or death, essentially, with these puppies. So we, we want to make sure we're on the side of life, you know? <laughs> Um, as much as we can be. Um, and uh, we don't see very many side effects as a lot of the previous older studies have shown. Um, and plus they're only on it for a shorter amount of time um, than those studies back, back when they were done, um, you know, showed. Uh, we put them on anti-emetic to keep them from vomiting. Um, the main one we use is Reglan or metoclopramide. We do add other ones in, um, and we'll go over this later, um, but that's the main one, and that's usually like if you're starting up, that's what you're going to use. It's, it's cheap, um, you can give it sub-Q, uh, and it works pretty well. And then you're going to need some fluids to give sub-Q. Uh, you always want to give the Batril with sub-Q fluids, because uh, the Batril can cause some abscessing. Um, but if you dilute it, you minimize the risk of that. So you want to dilute it. Um, and the fluids we use are mostly lactated ringer solution. It's a very good isotonic, just balanced solution. Doesn't sting as much as the other ones. You can use sodium chloride. Um, it stings a little bit, though, or plasma light. Um, but LRS is, is the one you should use. Um, and then, of course, you need your needles and syringes. We use 18-gauge uh, needles for everybody just because the flow rate is much higher than a smaller needle. And, you know, puppies don't always like it, but hey, it's going to go quicker. You know, sometimes it's better just to get it in fast than use a smaller needle and it takes forever and the puppy's squirming the whole time. Um, you'll need a snap test to diagnose it. And this is actually probably one of the higher expenses because uh, it's $20 for each snap test. So that's why you want to um, make sure you're evaluating the animal correctly. Um, and it's, like I said before, if they're just kind of quiet or they're just having diarrhea but they're not having other signs, you know, don't maybe just um, deworm them and wait on it, but if they're having a bunch of the signs, you know, and they're lethargic and that kind of thing, then okay, then let's test them. But um, it's, you know, if you waste a test, it's $20. So that's something that you want to either have a vet kind of evaluate them or just be very careful evaluating them. But if there's ever any question, just test them. Um, and this just goes over the different costs of each, each uh, medication here. So. Uh, for a 10-pound dog, it's roughly 16 to $36. dollars um. um, So we have a Parvo ICU here at Austin Pets Alive. We have a dedicated space at the shelter on site where we treat Parvo dogs, and it allows us to have a much greater capacity and to um, uh, specialize and do some more complicated treatments. Um, if you wanted to see what we have, some things you need in your Parvo ICU, you need cages, obviously. We have several different sizes. Um, you want them big enough where if a dog vomits or poops, especially overnight when we're not here, um, you want them to be able to move out of it so they don't have to sit in it all night. Um, you need some counter space. You need a medical, um, a cabinet to store your medications in. A lot of medications are light sensitive. 
Um, also a cabinet, if a dog like gets out in the middle of the night, it's harder for them to eat things that are in a cabinet. Hopefully that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that, that really hasn't happened yet. Um, you need a sink, you need a toilet, you need um, a place to do, you need laundry machines, washer and dryer. Um, and you also need a refrigerator, because some of the medications have to be refrigerated. This is our parvo entrance. It's like I was talking about the clean side and the dirty side. On the clean side, which is sort of to the back of the photo, we have um, a you know, changing area, lockers, a sink. The sink is kind of hard to see. Um, and there's the duct tape line, which is the delineator for us between the clean side and the dirty side. So you leave all your clothes on the clean side, you step over, you put on the parvo scrubs and the shoes, which are waiting for you right there on the dirty side. Um, there is a foot bath in that picture. It's an old picture. <laughs> um, so as you're building a team, you need, there's sort of four components. You need a licensed veterinarian who's going to, you know, write up the treatments. Um, and they also are the one who can order the medication, which normal people can't just go do. Um, <laughs> you need a team manager, which is what I do. So I recruit volunteers. I um, make the schedule for every week. I train the volunteers. Um, I make programming improvements. I keep up our website. Um, and then you need a group of dedicated volunteers who are really, really, really important. And they are um, an amazing part of your team. Uh, you want to choose quality over quantity. We have, I believe, uh, 17 volunteers right now. Um, so we don't have a whole lot. And then you also, um, we use medical technicians who go in and do the, the things that the volunteers maybe don't know how to do, like place catheters or do complicated medical treatments, or if there's like an emergency, sometimes they come back and help us. Um, I also sort of work as a technician for them, so I do a little bit of both. As your, um, how do you find these volunteers? I usually find them through email. Um, since we're really near the University of Texas, about half of our volunteers are students. Um, I started as a student when I was a freshman. Um, we do have an age limit. It has to be college students. You have to be 18 because there's a lot of responsibility. Um, so I, you know, we email student groups. We email um, the regular volunteer group. Although I have to say, I emailed the regular volunteer group. I emailed 700 people. I got like seven responses. Um, I send out a really intimidating email. I got like seven responses, and of those, I think two people ended up becoming volunteers. Um, when you, you know, recruit people, you want to be really professional because you want, if you take it seriously, they're much more likely to take it seriously. And we do set strict requirements. Um, one of the more important ones of those is that we require a six-month commitment. Um, if, if we're even going to train you, you have to come in twice a week for six months. And this is because it takes us three weeks to train you um, over six different shifts. Um, and it's a lot of time and energy, and it slows down everything when you're training a new person. Um, and also because you keep learning after you know your six your six training shifts, you're going to keep learning for several months. Um, so it, it doesn't really help anybody if you don't come in for at least six months. And most of our volunteers stay for much much longer than six months. We usually lose people because they move away or they graduate, not because they don't you know they don't want to do it anymore. Um, for training, we have um, right now we have a set curriculum. Um, we, we have six days, and each day you learn something different. You know, the first day you learn sub-cues and sort of an introduction. The second day, um, you, you know, you do more practice, and it gets more and more complicated. And our curriculum is totally posted online, so everybody is expected to read it before they come in. So one, they know what they're getting into, and two, um, they can focus on the things that need to be practiced rather than the things that need to be just memorized. And um, we really like to train the volunteers a lot because um, giving them more knowledge gives them, you know, more power. It makes them be more confident, and it lets them be more helpful as volunteers. So if they know why they're doing something as opposed to just like, well, it says this on the chart, so I'll do it, they can get good enough where if there's a change, they can contact the doctor and say, you know, um, this dog is vomiting a lot. Can I give another antiemetic, and can I give famotidine to calm his stomach down? And not just, you know, follow directions. Um, when you're recruiting volunteers, you do want to tell them up front that some of the dogs are going to die. No matter what we do, we can't save about 15% of them. Um, and I mean, you know, we make sure that they know it's not their fault. They did everything they could. These puppies had so much of a better chance than they did pretty much anywhere else. Um, it's, there's, and there's also protocols for you know, what you do with a dead dog. And they're written and they're posted so that you know the first time that happens or the 50th time you're, you know it's, it's upsetting and you want you need to know what to do. Um, we also have a Facebook page that lets our volunteer group kind of bond and commiserate and whatever they need to. Um, and we had an Eagle Scout recently who built us a memorial garden. There's a picture of it. Um, yes. 
Uh, we have an end of shift report every shift. Um, it gets emailed out. It just lets everybody know what's been going on. It's helpful because it lets people know like what to expect, how long they're going to be there, um, track the progress. It also is a place for us to do inventory and send it to the clinic so people can read it. Um, some things you need when you're setting up a full-on ICU as opposed to just a foster. There's sort of general supplies, cleaning supplies, and medical supplies. Um, under general supplies are just like things for the dogs and um, basic facility needs. Your fridge, your toilets, your bowls, your toys, your sweaters, your towels, your blankets, um, microwaves, thermometers, fun stuff like that. We have tons of different kinds of food in Parvo because these dogs are nauseous. They really don't want to eat. So we want to have things that are super tasty so they'll eat it if, even if they're not like feeling really well. And also because um, if these dogs have been offered food when they're nauseous, they don't want to eat it again. They associate it with being nauseous. So we keep all kinds of different things. We have um, like deli meat. We have different brands of wet food. We have baby food, which is both tasty and easy to force feed. Um, fresh chicken, chicken and rice, and your goal is to also have foods that are gen kind of healthy so they'll eventually start getting solid stools. Um, there's a lot of cleaning in Parvo, as you might imagine if you've ever like, dealt with a puppy, especially a sick puppy. Um, you need a sharps container, you have a lot of uh, needles. Um, you also need a parvocidal disinfectant. Bleach is like the cheapest one and the one that's easiest to find. We dilute it 1 to 30. Um, you don't want to dilute it any more than that. If you dilute it less than that, it like creates a horrible mist that it makes you cough and hurt your eyes. Um, laundry detergent, you do a lot of laundry. Hand soap, dish soap, washer and dryer, broom and mop. Uh, you really do need a mop. Um, toilet paper, trash bags, stuff like that. Okay, I'll go over the medical stuff here. So you'll need just different needles. You'll want the 18 gauge for the sub -Qs. And then your smaller needles, um, just for the pulling up the medications and that kind of thing. You want a 1cc syringe. That way, when you have small little puppies, you can accurately um, you know, pull up the medication. And then you'll want IV lines in order to give the fluids, as well as um, if you have a more severe case, uh, we put in a catheter, an IV catheter. So this is something you may not be able to do. Um, but eventually down the line, if you can, it's awesome because a lot of these puppies do um, get pretty severe and start losing protein and that kind of thing. Uh, or they may come in shocky and so you'd have to place a catheter and give fluids that way. So we have fluid pumps as well. Um, so this is where I want to go more in depth about the medications. We have the antibiotics that I went over. Now if you put an uh, IV catheter in, we use a different form of ampicillin. Um, ampicillin or cefazolin, and it's a clear solution. Um, for the most part, you never want to put a cloudy injectable solution into the vein. That's pretty much a rule. Um, there's only like one or two medications and you would never use them for parvo. Um, and then we use lactated ringers, like I said, even in the vein, it's an awesome fluid. Um, now the thing is, and we didn't list this up here, but an awesome thing to have is a centrifuge and then um, PCV and uh, tubes, so you can do a PCV total protein, so you can measure the red blood cell count, as well as the protein levels. Now this, you know, might be something a little over the top, but um, if you have that capability, you can know if the puppy's not doing well because there's so much protein loss due to blood in the diarrhea and that kind of thing, which happens a lot. So this really helps us determine how many fluids to give, and then if we need head of starch, which is actually a protein replacing fluid. I mean, we use that a ton. Basically, our protocol is if, especially a small puppy is having any kind of bloody diarrhea, we start giving head of starch just, just to prophylactically um, prevent them from getting low protein, because low protein can kill them. They need protein in the vein to help keep the fluid within the vessels, essentially. Um, so it's kind of a big deal. Um, your antiemetics, there's Reglan, which we talked about. That's your general antiemetic. Um, but there also are other ones, and we'll talk about here, um, Serenia and Anzimat, and they're more expensive. So um, they just work at different areas. Serenia is like, it works right at the level of the brain, so it's just going to stop any kind of vomiting right there. Um, Anzimat, as well as the Reglan, works more on the motility of the esophagus and the GI tract. Um, so they work differently, but those are more expensive. Um, another uh, great add-on add is famotidine or pepsid, and we, we can get that injectable. So these animals that are just vomiting, even after they get kind of get over parvo, but they just can't handle keeping food down and they're eating, but they'll just vomit food, we'll start giving them famotidine to help calm their stomachs. Um, and then if, secondarily, if you have an upper respiratory infection that forms, 
We also, you know, have doxycycline we can give them orally, or if they're really bad and they don't respond to that, which some don't, um, we give oxytetracycline, um, and that you can actually give in the vein. So that's another um, option if they're constantly vomiting, they won't keep the doxycycline down, and they've just got really bad upper respiratory infections as well. Um, and then dewormers, Panicure and Strongid, we'll either deworm them right in the beginning when they come in, um, just depending on how they look, or after they've gotten over their signs and say they're eating, but they're not vomiting anymore, but they still have diarrhea, we'll, we'll deworm them just to make sure that's not a secondary cause of the diarrhea and, you know, versus the uh, parvo. Uh, dextrose is really important, or caro syrup, or, you know, you can just mix sugar and water. You know, that's the cheapest way. Um, just to put on their gums. If it's a small puppy, they're not eating, um, they're vomiting, you're going to have to keep their glucose levels up. And basically, our protocol is if you have a puppy that's five pounds or less, we will put an IV catheter in and run them on fluids with dextrose in it. But if you don't have that, then I would say just put, put it on their gums, um, like a CC per 10 pounds, two to three times a day, just to keep those um, blood glucose levels up, because they can die from hypoglycemia. Uh, and then metronidazole, we start them on um, oral metronidazole tablets right after, once they're eating, and we can, they'll keep it down. We start them on that just to help firm their stool up. Um, so there are the equipment. Uh, clippers for if you're going to put a catheter in are nice to have around. <clears throat> um, and then just try to save money wherever you can. Um, Obviously, we deal a lot with donations. We get a ton of donations. Um, we can place a, a post on Facebook saying, hey, we need this for the Parvo Award, and a lot of times people will bring it in you know, that day. Um, oral syringes, we recycle. So we clean them out, you know, use trifectant or bleach or whatnot, clean them out, reuse them. Um, hand towels will wash. Um, obviously, we use volunteers a ton. Uh, Katie's really the only paid worker in the Parvo ward, and everybody else is, you know, just, they're volunteers, and so Katie's awesome, because um, she... Uh, I was a volunteer for four yeah. years. <laughs> I started out there. Um, we also will use one Parvo test. Once they're over their signs, and they've had two solid stools, we'll use one Parvo test on multiple animals to save money. Um, and then uh, protocols we rely on, it just, it helps so that I don't have to be in there that long. Um, they know, the volunteers and Katie, you know, they know exactly what to do. We even have a shock protocol. If an animal comes in and they're lateral, not moving, just really shocky, um, they know to put a catheter in, to bolus, start bolusing fluids, to give them dextrose, and then once they're in that process, they'll contact me or, you know, um, text me or whatnot and say, hey, we have this dog that just came in, what do you want us to do? Um, but they already got the shock protocol going, so we, you know, we know that we can try to stabilize that puppy. Um, a supportive care, you know, after they're um, somewhat doing okay, they're, they're keeping down food, especially these little puppies, we start force feeding them, and baby food is awesome, because uh, a lot of them really like baby food, and you can just start going slow, just give them a couple cc's at a time, you know, slowly reintroduce them to food, um, and then chicken, they love chicken. It's, you know, even at, over hot dogs, I mean, they just love chicken. Um, and chicken sticks, we use a lot, the baby chicken sticks. Um, you know, you're going to want to keep them warm um, and still give Reglan if they're vomiting. You know, a lot of times we'll stop the antibiotics, but we'll keep on giving the Reglan just to help them in case their GI tract is just um, so affected by the parvo they can't keep anything down. We just keep on giving the Reglan. And so these are just your overall costs. Um, if you had an easy minor case where you're just giving sub-Qs for five to seven days, that's what it would um, be. And then to your severe case where this dog is probably in there 10 to 14 days, depending. Um, and we're giving that dog IV fluids, head of starch, um, uh, you know, force feeding it three times, four times a day maybe, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, basically on intake, we, we always uh, verify that they're positive. Sometimes they're not positive. Um, 
it's hard to say, you know, if you, we have to see the test or we have to have a record that the veterinarian said parvo positive, um, because sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's just parasites, and that would not be good if you put a dog with parasites back in the parvo ward and they get parvo. So we always want to make sure it's definitely parvo, and we vaccinate them immediately on intake. There are very rare instances we don't, because um, it's very important, especially with the possibility of them getting distemper and whatnot, we just vaccinate them. Um, and then the physical assessment's really important, and it, um, a vet doesn't always have to do it. The Parvo volunteers and Katie, you know, they're trained very well to look at the main things, which are gum color, or is it pink? Um, when you press on the gums, does it go from pink to white to pink again really fast? Usually within two seconds is normal. Um, also, we look at the skin tent. When you pick up their skin and pinch it, does it go right back down or does it stay up? And puppies always have, they'll have a mild skin tent and that's pretty normal. But if it just sticks up and doesn't go down, that puppy's pretty dehydrated. Um, their mentation, you know, are they bright, alert responsive? We'd call that BAR, B-A-R. If they're quiet alert responsive, Q-A-R. Um, lethargic, we'll put on there. Those are the three we use. Obviously, if they're totally out, then that's comatose. But um, the assessment's very important. And a lot of times, these animals will come in shocky. Um, but all they need is uh, dextrose, and it's pretty amazing. It could, they'll just be super hypoglycemic. And you'll get them in there, you'll start messing with them, giving them fluids, and then just put some dextrose on their gums, and they pop up. It's like, you know, the it's living dead, dog. honestly. They just pop up, and you wouldn't believe it. And that's all they needed, um, obviously, and then parvo treatment, but uh, to get them past that point there. So. And then you always want to uh, wash your hands between everybody, because you don't know what they have. They could have an upper respiratory that you don't know about when they come in, so you don't want to spread that. Um, oh, so here's going over all that. Um, yeah, if their gums are pale, you know, that's bad. Um, they could be pale in initially, and then once you start giving them fluids, they'll brighten up. So pale pink, it's not as um, severe as if they're white. If they're white, then you're going to want to worry. That's where the PCV total protein comes into play. Um, so you can check to see if they're anemic, and they may need a blood transfusion if you have those capabilities. Um, if they're gray, uh, you know, or bluish, uh, that, that's really bad. That's pretty much near death, um, and they need shock treatment ASAP. The other thing we look at is the temperature of their paws, um, which gives us a lot of information. You don't want them to be cold. If they're cold, that means they're not regulating their temperature, um, and so you need to help them out. You need to get them on heating pads, warm them back up, um, and make sure they stay warm. And then um, we usually will take their rectal temperature as well just to make sure, because they can also spike fevers. So you can go from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, and we always do these assess assessments twice a day, you know, every 12 hours. That way we can know if anything's changing. Um, and then I go in there once a day just to uh, manipulate the treatments as they are, you know, resolving and whatnot. Um, okay. So this is an example of a minor, like a very minor case. We just, you know, the dogs may be a little bit quiet, but um, not no severe um, vomiting or diarrhea. It's just kind of mild here and there. Um, they may be a tad bit dehydrated, but otherwise their gums are pink. Um, they're not that bad. So that we would just do sub, sub Q treatments with the antibiotics and antiemetics and whatnot as well as the fluids. Um, now, if you have a little bit of a more severe case, now this dog might be a little more lethargic. Um, they're vomiting more. They're having more diarrhea, um, more diffuse. You know, it's very liquidy, and they're just losing a lot of fluids. Um, you know, then we would put a catheter in um, and start giving them the IV uh, ampicillin and then put them on a constant um, fluid rate. That way they're just getting they're really getting hydrated to account for all those fluid losses. Um, and this would also be if they're having like mild bloody diarrhea, um, then we would add in head of starch there as well to replace that. Now, if you have a severe case, you know, you're talking about they're super lethargic. I mean, they're, they don't want to get up. They're just really feeling bad. Um, they have just constant vomiting and diarrhea. This would be a case that, you know, you're not just only going to give Reglin, but you're going to try to add Serenia or Anzimet on if, if you have those by chance. Um, and basically, we have those in our cabinet, but we only use those medications for really severe cases. 
just because they're so expensive. Um, and then we're going to do the IV treatment via the IV catheter. Um, we'll even do the Batril IV, and we dilute it. You have to dilute it. If you give it too fast, it can cause neurological issues. Um, so you want to make sure to, to dilute it and give it very slowly. We'll give it over like 20 minutes. Um, and then we'll put them on a pump with dextrose to just give them a constant dextrose infusion, keep their blood sugar up, especially these tiny little puppies. Um, and head of starch, you might not um, be familiar with head of starch or might not be able to get it, but if you can, it's awesome. Um, because when these little, these little guys, their protein goes down, they just won't eat, even if they're past the parvo um, signs, but they're just not eating, it's, it may do, be due to low protein. And so the minute you start giving them replacing their proteins, they start feeling better and they may just start eating just because of that. So that's an awesome thing to have. Um, and then um, force feeding, once, once they're kind of back on their feet and not, basically if they're not vomiting, try to force feed them because that'll keep their blood sugar up, you know, get them some calories and that kind of thing. Um, and then discharge, we usually wait until um, we get two solid stools. So this will be, you know, between usually five, day five and ten, somewhere around there. Um, they'll stop vomiting. They may still have diarrhea, so that's when you put them on Metro. And then all of a sudden, you know, they start having solid stools. And then after two, we'll test them out. Um, sometimes, you know, there might be, the, you might have a severe case that's, that's in the ward for longer, almost up to you know two weeks or so. Um, usually, those guys though they have secondary things going on, such as an upper respiratory disease. Um, so you have to. That's the other thing, and we'll talk about complications here um, later on. But bathing, you want to make sure to really just bathe them as well as you can. Scrub their nails, clip their nails first, scrub them. Go in their paw pads, just get everything. Check their ears. Sometimes they get uh, feces caked up in their ears. You want to make sure to check every area you can. Um, we do two baths just to make sure we're, we're definitely getting everything. Um, yeah, around their rectum, you know, under the tail, the paws are key places. So our complications, you never know when you get a puppy in. They may have distemper as well. You just don't know. Um, sometimes it'll show up a couple days after they come in. So if you do notice signs of distemper, say, you know, very bad upper respiratory signs, any upper respiratory signs we see, we always isolate, we treat them last, and we just assume that it could be distemper, so we treat them, you know, accordingly. Um, and then if it doesn't really pan out and it's just kind of a, a mild upper respiratory, then, you know, we just treat it as that. But if you notice really bad nasal discharge, they're just, you know, they got goopy eyes, they're just really lethargic, they're spiking fevers all the time. Um, just keep this temper in mind because you never know with these little guys. Um, and some of them just get really bad upper respiratory infections from having their immune system weakened and, and all that. So you'll have to be uh, ready to treat that with your doxycycline and that kind of thing. Um, and just why are we treating these guys? Uh, because they're going to get dehydrated, you know, they're probably going to get hypoglycemic if they're tiny. We have to keep their temperature up. Um, and uh, we want to do it as fast as we can. We don't really have diagnostics like blood work and that kind of thing, but if the PCV, if you have the PCV and total protein and you can do that, that's, that's a huge diagnostic tool. Um, you know, head of starch and dextrose are awesome to have, like I said. You want to reassess all their um, physical exam findings, the basic ones, like their temperature, their gum color, um, and their attitude twice a day. That helps out a lot to see the cycles of what's happening. Um, and then, like I said, we have a shock protocol if they're, they are shocky, um, and we'll just give them fluids as fast as possible, um, and everybody knows that protocol. Other complications, you know, they can have secondary uh, gastrointestinal worms. Um, and like I said, we'll start treating those as soon as we can. As soon as they'll keep, keep it down, we'll start treating for that. Um, or if they have mange, they come in, they might have demodex, they might have sarcop. So those are other things you want to look for so that you can keep them isolated if need be. Um, and then URI and distemper we talked about. For bad URIs, um, 
will start azithromycin. That's really the, the best drug for URI. So if doxycycline isn't working, if the Batril isn't kicking it, then add on azithromycin. Um, the oxytetracycline is another thing you can have on hand that's injectable. We don't use it a lot, but like I said, if they're vomiting really bad and they have really severe URIs, it's good to have. Um, some of them won't, um, they'll have adverse reactions to it and it might cause them to vomit or have a decreased appetite, so you have to watch that. Um, but it, it is good to use on a case-by-case -case basis. And then nebulizing. Nebulizing is huge. It's easy to do. Um, and it really helps to break up all those secretions and get them past the URI. Abscesses, uh, like I was saying before, the Batril can cause an abscess. You want to make sure to dilute it. Um, and the more you dilute it, the better. So in a dog that is just getting sub-Q fluids, we do 100 m milliliters uh, per 10 pounds of fluids. Um, to really dilute the Batril. Um, and then uh, we monitor that site. If it's really painful, if you feel a little bump forming, uh, it's warm, then that can be an indication that there's a Batril abscess forming. Um, and we just start warm compressing it, trying to get it out like a pimple, basically, um, until it bursts. And then if it's on the legs, um, sometimes they'll get um, abscesses from the catheters and stuff like that, and so we'll put a honey bandage over that to draw it out. Um, and then once they're holding down uh, you know, food and not vomiting, we can add Clavamox, which is a good antibiotic for these batrial abscesses. Clavamox and then doxycycline are the two best antibiotics for the batrial abscesses. Um, you know, this is a kind of a more, if they're in a really, in a bad case of shock, um, we'll put a jugular catheter. And that's really something I would do, or maybe a few of our technicians know how to do it, but that's, everybody doesn't know how to do that. So um, yeah, if they can't place a catheter, they notify you know, one of us over in the clinic or myself, and we'll help them out. Intussusception is something a lot of veterinarians hardly ever see. But since we have so many puppies with such you know, profuse diarrhea, we see it a lot. And it's where the intestine basically telescopes and goes within each other and it forms a, a mass in there and then doesn't let stool go past. And so it's, it's really bad. Um, and then that part of the intestine will actually start to die. So that's another thing that I monitor for. I'll palpate their abdomen when I go in there um, to make sure that's not a, a factor. Um, but that is something you may see. And it, it may be something that you know they just have to try to get through themselves or if you have the capability to surgically fix it, then that's, that's another option, which, which we usually always try um, to do if we catch it. Um, some other complications, they may get laxity in their tendons just because they're so weak. So they'll be walking kind of on their, on their knees or their wrists in the front, per se, um, either or, either over or under. And that corrects with time. You give them two weeks, and, and that'll correct. Some people try to splint them, but um, usually that doesn't doesn't help. Um, and then, okay. <laughs> and then uh, postpartum arthritis. This is questionable um, if this even occurs, but it could be due to just the virus kind of going through the system. Um, and, or the Batril. I don't really think it's the Batril, though. I think it's more just the parvovirus. You know, it goes everywhere. It's systemic. Um, so they might come up with that. You might have to deal with that, put them on some fish oils and tramadol in the future and get them past it. Um, we don't really see that a lot, um, and usually that should go away. And then the reason we got started, there's just so many puppies being killed due to parvo, and it's, it really is pretty easy to treat if you have the staff uh, and the capabilities to do so. Um, and it's contagious, everybody freaks out, but um, like I said, it's easy to treat. Um, and puppies, once they're treated, they get adopted out really quick. Um, so, and they're fine. They live nice, long, healthy lives. Um, so yeah, these are just arguments against treating and why we do it. And I think that pretty much sums it up. Okay, any questions? <laughs>